Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website can be found at scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you'd find the archives. That's where you go to support this mission of truth. Well, I appreciate you joining me this morning. Uh, it is my great privilege and uh, my great privilege to, to study the Word of God and to be able to get up early and open the Bible and do these readings and studies with all of you. And I just appreciate you tuning in every morning and appreciate those of you who are praying for me and praying for the podcast and uh, those of you who support the podcast. And uh, it's just, it's a great blessing to me and a great privilege and a great honor. And uh, I'm so thankful that God has given me this work. Which kind of goes into uh, today's topic. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which deals with spiritual gifts. We're also going to do th- chapter 13 also, but it's only a couple of verses long. Uh, but chapter 12 deals with spiritual gifts in the sense that everyone has been given uh, either a gift or a calling or something to use to further the kingdom of God. And Paul's going to make the point that one gift isn't more important than the other. One calling is not more important than the other. It's We're all part of the body, and the body needs all of its parts to function. He'll make the point the hand wouldn't say to the foot, I don't need you. That would be ridiculous. We often get caught up in this idea that... Uh, that spiritual gift means that, that person's more anointed or more blessed. Or what that person's doing for the kingdom of God, the work that God has given them is, is more important. Or we'll run into situations, and I run into this a lot, where people will be telling us what we should be doing differently. Or uh, God will call us to a work, and then friends and family will be telling you you should be doing something else, Right? I, I often get messages, emails, things of that nature saying, you should be doing this, or you should be doing that, or you should be teaching about this, or talking about that. No. I'm doing what God has called me to do. And this is the role that He has appointed, the portion He has given me. And I'm blessed to be able to do it. This is what He's called me to do. Or friends and family would tell me, you should start a church. And I'm like, no, that's not what God has called me to do, at least not at this point in my life. He's called me to read and teach the scriptures through podcasting. Someone else may be called to preach and start a church. Somebody else may be called to be a missionary and go overseas or just a missionary to city. Somebody else might be called to create a food bank. Some people may have the gift to teach. Some people may have the gift to preach. Some people may have the gift of healing. Some people may have... We've all been given something different. And it's on purpose. And that's the point that Paul's trying to make. Let me read this short paragraph to you from Matthew Henry, and then we'll read chapters 12 and 13. Here's what Matthew Henry says. He says, In this chapter, the apostle considers the case of spiritual gifts, which were very plentifully poured out on the Corinthian church. He considers their original, that they are from God, their variety and use, that they were all intended for one of the same general end, that being the advancements, the advancement of Christianity and the church edification. He illustrates this by an allusion to the human body, in which all members have a mutual relation and subservancy, and each has its proper place and use. He tells us that the church is the body of Christ, and the members are very variously gifted for the benefit of the whole body and each particular member, and them. Then he closes with an exhortation to seek somewhat more beneficial than these gifts. And just a spoiler alert, Paul's going to end by saying there's actually something more to seek 
more that you can do than these spiritual gifts, and that is to love. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. There's our introduction for this morning. Let's dig in to the Word of God. Corinthians chapter 12. Open up your hearts and minds. And let's see what the Word of God has to say to us this morning. Verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So please note, Paul's first making the point that you can't say you're a follower of Christ, but then speak poorly of Jesus, right? And say he's accursed. Furthermore, you can't say that Jesus is Lord unless it's by the Holy Spirit. Verse 4. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit and to another a word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even the body is one, and yet has many members. And all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of a body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I am not part of the body, is it not for this reason, and any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? So please note, you see the brilliance of this analogy that Paul has put forth. He's saying, if, imagine if all we all did was have the gift of healing. Well, then no one would be able to teach. No one would be able to lead people to Christ. No one would be able to uh, prophesy. No one would be, you know what I mean? Like, you can't have one person. Or what if we all just did podcast? Like what I do. Well, they would, these, this would be a dime a dozen. But then there would be nobody going into foreign lands and preaching the good news. There'd be nobody setting up churches for people to attend and hear and learn about God and to uh, and, and to come together with other people that are like-minded. If we all did the same thing, that just, it just it would be as silly as if we were all if if the body if we were all an eye, or we were all an ear. And Paul's making that point: if 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 you're all an eye, who would hear? Or if you're all an ear, 
Where would the sense of smell be? Like, you need all of these things. Continuing on. Verse 18. But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more present or more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may be or may have the same care for one another. See, some people may make the mistake of thinking that the calling that they've been given, the work that they've been given to do, the spiritual gifts that they've been given are, are just meaningless or less because they see somebody else doing something that they consider so much grander. Not the case. Every piece is needed God is using each one of us to further and accomplish his goals in this world. And what you're doing is not to be diminished. Furthermore, what you're doing is not to be exalted above whatever, what what God has called other people to do. Do not think yourself better. Continuing on. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So please note, this is an area that I think has really fallen apart, at least in Western society. We don't bear the burdens of each other like the church is supposed to. I remember when the persecution... Um, started happening, maybe you guys will remember this, in Syria around like 2013, 14, and there was all kinds of videos coming out of just horrific things that were happening to Christians, and I even made a YouTube video about it. It had like 100,000 views in like 24 hours, and then YouTube came in and censored it, uh, put a copyright right claim on it, even though it was just me speaking. There was no music or anything. And one of my frustrations is I just felt like nobody cared. And I'm like, this is a, these are our brothers and sisters and no one's grieving this. No one seems to want to take notice. And I was just deeply troubled by that. Because like Paul says here, if one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. Like if you stub your toe, you feel it, right? <laughs> right? That's how it's supposed to be. Continuing on, verse 27, Now you are Christ's body, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, and then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have the gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. And I show you still a more excellent way. So that's how chapter 12 ends. And then we have 
13 short verses for chapter 13 to continue this thought. I'll get to it in a second. Again, Paul's pointing out there's all these different types of gifts. and things. Some, some gift is just the gift of being a helper. Right? He says gift of helps. Some gifts are administration. You're good at keeping track of everything and having everything organized and in place. You may... That doesn't mean that your gift is lacking and can't be used for the kingdom of God because you're not preaching and teaching. All of these things are important. But and but Paul goes on to end with this statement that he continues the thought on here for these next 13 verses. He says, he says all these gifts, and yet I show you still a more excellent way. So take this to heart. You've heard... Th- the unfortunate thing about Corinthians 13, which we're getting ready to read here, is that it's so powerful. It is the one of the most pro- profound things ever written in human history. And because of that, it's been overused in, in culture and at weddings and um, in writings and things to the point where we've kind of grown numb to the words. So we need to really open ourselves up here and open up our hearts to kind of receive this truth afresh. Here's the more excellent way than the spiritual gifts he mentioned. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. Please note, I don't know about you, but this cuts to the heart. It is my opinion that love is an action, not an ooey-gooey feeling. Love is something you choose to do. And admittedly, it's definitely something I personally need to work on. And when he says, like, look, if you can, if you, if you have all this gift here, prophecy, knowledge, wisdom, and all that, but you don't love, it's useless. Haven't you met these Christians? in the workplace, or maybe they're in your family, or maybe they're in the church that you attend. They're all about God, right? And they're praising Jesus all the time, which is beautiful. But then, like, you go out to eat with them, and they're just cruel to the server. Like, they complain constantly, and they're mean to the server, and they act like the server's second class. I'm using that as an example because it's something I've observed many times. To the point where I want to put my head, I want to climb underneath the table because I can't believe how you can praise Jesus and you can't wait for the return of Jesus, but then you're mean to this teenager who's making $3 an hour trying to serve you food because they're not getting it all perfect. If the most important thing for your day is that your eggs didn't come out hot, really? And let, me, and let me paint this picture. Here's another reason why it's important. And I'm just going to stay with the restaurant example, but I'm sure you all have a, an example of your own coming to mind. Imagine you, sit, you go to the restaurant, you sit down. The food comes out. Everyone at the table bows their head, prays, gives thanks for the food. Right? Everybody around you sees it. And to most people, it's strange behavior. Maybe the server even sees it. Then you go to eat and your yeah, your food's not as hot as you'd like it to be. Or the server forgot to bring something out. Or, you know, and then you're rude to the server. And you're mean to the server. And you're murmuring and complaining. You want to talk to the manager. La, 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 la. You have poorly represented Christ. You have demonstrated to the server and all the people around you that you serve God and then you act like a jerk. (laughs) Paul's saying, you 
can have all the gifts in the world. But if you don't love, it's useless. It's as bad as a clanging cymbal. Let me continue our study. I'm just going to start over. If I speak with tongues of men of, or an, and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Mm, that's heart piercing. Verse 4. Here's one of the most beautiful things ever written. This is the part that I'm talking about that we've kind of grown numb to. Let's try to avoid that. Love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now please note, there is one thing I want to point out about this. It is not loving to condone Embrace and celebrate perversity. That's something that's happening in our culture right now. And you have Christian leaders and Christian pastors and, and people coming out saying, this is what it looks like to, to be loving. It is to embrace this wickedness. It is to embrace this evil. Furthermore, let's just let them lead the church. What does Paul say? One of the things that love does not do is rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Now, there's a way to tell the truth and to love the person as you're doing it. But embracing it and saying, just be who you are. Go ahead and, 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 and celebrate sin. That's not love. But we have, in our culture, we have labeled that as love but that's not love if anything that's hate it's the opposite of love because you're saying continue in your filth and your sin continue separated from God and what's the internal outcome of that the eternal outcome of that is eternal damnation verse 8 love never fails but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, and think like a child, and reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but a, the greatest of these is love. And that is the end here, that last verse, faith, hope, love. The, the re, this is heart piercing to me because those are probably the three things that I struggle with the most in the time and the day that we are living in, right? It's like I want to have faith, but look at what's going on. It's like I want to hope, but look at what's going on. It's like I want to love, but look at what's going on. I'm so angry about it. I'm so sick of this over here. I'm so sick of that over here. These are not easy. 
But Paul's saying these are the three greatest things that we can do as followers of Jesus. It's to have faith. It's to hope and believe and to love. But I just want to preference, let's not confuse love with tolerance of evil. Because in this beautiful description of love, like Paul says, love doesn't. He says all the things that love does, and he says, but what love doesn't do is rejoice with un- and rejoice in unrighteousness. Well, there you, <laughs> there you have it, my friends. I hope I've done justice to this study this morning. I pray you've been blessed and strengthened in the powerful name of Jesus. Thank you for listening. If you're being blessed by this word, please remember that it's 100% listener supported. So please consider supporting it by going to scriptureandprophecy.com. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time, God bless.